Hey everyone, Kevin here coming to you from a beautiful, or on a beautiful Sonoma morning. Week six, red wine processing. We did a little bottling yesterday in lab. Today we'll talk about red wine processing and I'll do it in three parts. Before you um, go to Kenwood next week, please have a look at this uh, video. I put a link to this video on Moodle. It shows some great winemaker choices when it comes to Pinot Grigio. And we'll be talking about winemaker choices when we go to Kenwood. So let's get on with today. Um, I talked a little bit about cleaning and sanitizing yesterday. So I basically talked to you about what is on this slide, so I won't repeat it. But I will say on the next slide that when you sanitize, there are a couple of choices. What we're trying to do is kill microbes after we get rid of the dirt. And you can do kill microbes with high temp, high temperature, or with chemicals. So high temperature would be hot water or steam, primarily. We may get a steam generator soon at Schoen Farm, so we'll get some experience of that if it comes in this semester. You can use hot water or steam. The amount of time you apply the hot water or steam is determined by uh, how hot it is. It's it's, you can kill microbes either with hotter temperatures or with more time. So lower temperatures require more time. If you, if you want to use chemicals, there are lots of choices. Um, chlorine is one, but we don't use chlorine much anymore because of the risk for making uh, TCA or trichloroanisole. You can, however, use chlorine dioxide, and many wineries generate that in the winery. Chlorine dioxide won't liberate chlorine that can be used to make TCA. So that's safe, and that's a, that's a good sanitizer. There are many other properties out there. Parasitic acid is used, or has been used, by some wineries. You need higher amounts of personal protective equipment um, if you're going to use that, because it's a little more dangerous. Some people use ozone. Uh, likewise, uh, that needs a lot of uh, caution, but a lot of people use ozone these days. You can use iodine, and of course sulfur dioxide works. We add that to wine, of course. Uh, we burn sulfur wicks in empty barrels, etc. So you can use sulfur dioxide. Um, or you can use ethanol. Or you can use, like we did yesterday, we used that proxy carb. And so Products like ProxyCarb are high pH sanitizing solutions. So trisodium phosphate is a high pH solution. We used it with chlorine, so we used chlorinated trisodium phosphate. But you can use just trisodium phosphate, and that's listed here on the slide as one of the lower pH, so pH 11, lower pH choices for sanitizing. And oftentimes lower pH choices will be used during the year after fermentation, so post-harvest, um, because we're just moving wine from tank to tank or vessel to vessel, and the tanks or the vessels don't get as um, dirty with uh, when you're just moving wine. Post-fermentation, you tend to have more um, more tartrates, more um, stuff inside the tank, and so you sometimes need a, a stronger cleaning solution. So that's where you'll go to a higher, uh, a lower, or well, a higher pH, sorry, uh, like pH 13. Um, so something like caustic soda, sodium hydroxide uh, at a higher pH. And again, higher pH, it's, it requires a little more per personal protective equipment, which means goggles, um, gloves, wearing an apron like we do in class, that sort of thing. So uh, those are a couple of the uh, chemical choices that are commonly used in the winery. So we will be talking about that as we get further along this semester. Let's move on to the next topic, which is the Grape Crush Report. So it just came out, comes out in February every year, and talks about uh, the results of the, the prior harvest. Uh, the state is divided into 17 grape growing districts shown here on this map and if we zoom in on the next slide you can see Sonoma County is District 3. If you Google California Grape Crush Report you'll get um, it's, the website comes up easily and there's a summary report which is just a PDF document and then you can download the Excel spreadsheet 
Um, it's actually, uh, I think, eight different spreadsheets that have tons of detail about which varietals have been crushed, how much people paid for them, what the bricks were when they were crushed. There's all kinds of details. So it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, I'll show you a couple of highlights. Here's one. In 2014, we crushed uh, 4.2 million tons of grapes in California. So 4.2 million or... Um, 4,160,000 exactly, but rounding to 4.2 million. And that's divided up with white wine, between white wine, red wine, table grapes, and then grapes that are grown just for raisins. So you can see we were down a little bit from the big harvest in 2013, but still over uh, 4 million tons. So I, I tend to think, um, as a rule of thumb, that we're somewhere around 4 million tons typically. If you look at what we crushed, Chardonnay is the winner. And Chardonnay is the winner in our county as well, as we'll see in a sec. But 17.2% of the crushed tons were Chardonnay. Cab Sauv comes in next, and this is statewide. Cab Sauv comes in next. Then you see uh, Zin, still big, white Zin and red Zin, of course. Um, that's next would be French Columbard grown primarily out in the Central Valley uh, for bulk white wines. And then Merlot, uh, Pinot Noir comes in next. So Pinot Noir still hasn't caught Merlot, but uh, of course there's a lot more Pinot Noir planted than there was 15 years ago or so. And then you see the other varieties here as well. So you can get all those details on the crush report. If you look at dollars per ton statewide, prices were up for red grapes and down for white grapes. So uh, the red line is red grapes. The uh, blue line there is white grapes. The other blue line at the bottom is table grapes. Um, but the ones I'm pointing to are red and white grapes. Um, the, number, the, the orange line in the middle is all types of grapes crushed. So statewide price is a little up for reds, a little down for whites from 2013 to 2014. Sonoma County only, it's interesting to look at what we crushed. So these are tons crushed. And look at Chardonnay again is the winner at 86,000 tons. Um, if you look at the list of whites, this is a fairly complete list. I took out some of the whites that have very small numbers. But Chardonnay is the big winner. Sauve Blanc is next. And then it drops off quite a bit. Uh, the next biggest one would be Pinot Gris right there. And it's interesting to look at what else is on the list and think about um, what you want to, might want to make when you become a winemaker or work in a winery. There's some interesting varietals on here, um, some of which don't get um, a lot of press, but some of which are up and coming, like Albarino, the first one on the list, used in Vino Verde in Portugal, and an up and coming wine, especially in the wine bars of LA where I used to, uh, used to live. Um, so let's go on and look at red grapes in Sonoma County, tons crushed. So the winner there is Cab Sauv, 46,000 tons. So again, if you go back to uh, Chardonnay, we were at 86,000. So Cabernet, 46,000, bringing in second place. In our county, Pinot Noir is huge, and that's at 47,000 tons. Um, and actually is higher than Cabernet. Now I believe that's, I hadn't noticed that, and I believe that that is uh, the first year that that's the case, but I will go back and check prior year numbers. So interesting that uh, Pinot Noir is ahead of Cab last year. So very good. And then you look at uh, Merlot, of course still big, um, Syrah bringing in um, fifth place actually, Zinfandel is fourth place at uh, 15,000. So Pinot Noir, Cab, Merlot, Zin, and then Syrah. Okay, so you can get a lot of more detail out on the crush report. Let's go on and talk about red wine processing. So red wines, more tannin, more body. We're less focused on fruit flavors oftentimes than we are with whites because of the tannin in the body. There's, there are just some different characters we get to play with that we don't, we don't get to play with as much in white wines. We can make reds with low, no, or lots of oak character. 
and they can be dry, off dry, or very sweet, but as you know, they're usually dry. We can make the, something like late harvest zin and make it very sweet, but oftentimes dry. The phenolic compounds in grapes are antioxidants, and so we talked about phenolic compounds a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you again what defines that. Chemically, it's that six-membered ring that has that OH group on it, and we had some double bonds in the ring as well. That, that structure there is called phenol, and that's a generic structure and there are many, many different compounds that start with this basic structure and then they add to it so that there'll be a very complicated molecule, but part of the molecule includes this phenol structure that I've shown here. And that defines the whole class of compounds called phenolics. And we also call them polyphenolics oftentimes because there are several or at least two phenol structures within the compound. And then you link phenolic compounds together oftentimes. And you've probably heard about polymerizing tannins to make large tannins, to make large molecular structures. And when we polymerize phenol groups or phenol molecules, we make polyphenolics. So you see that a lot. Phenolic compounds are in the skins of grapes. We, har we uh, ferment reds in contact with the skins, of course, in order to extract a lot of those phenolic compounds. You could do the same with whites, but you typically don't want phenolic compounds in your white wine, which impart a harshness and a bitterness that doesn't complement flavors in white grapes, but does beautifully in red grapes. The red coloring is also a phenolic compound and that of course comes from the skins as well. Phenolics are antioxidants so they will react with oxygen. They'll absorb some of the oxygen that gets into um, wine during fermentation, that gets in through the cork in a bottle, that enters a barrel. Some of that oxygen we, we want specifically because it helps polymerize phenolic compounds. It polymerizes tannins and softens them. So part of the aging process is allowing a little bit of oxygen in to help polymerize phenolic compounds. When you, the, the flip side of that is that phenolic compounds can protect against oxidation because they absorb oxygen. They'll react with oxygen and keep oxygen from reacting with ethanol to make acetaldehyde, which is that nutty or apple cider flavor. It'll, it, phenolics will prevent oxygen from reacting with uh, fruity compounds that give us our fruit flavors and uh, they'll, keep the, it'll, they'll keep the wine fresher. So because reds have, naturally have higher antioxidant capacity, we call it, have higher phenolics, so they have higher capacity for absorbing oxygen. Therefore, reds are not as sensitive to oxidation as whites. And so back to the slide here, they can be harvested under warmer temperatures. We often harvest at night still, and part of that's because we want to preserve the freshness in the red grapes, just like we do in whites. But we, we can harvest under warmer temperatures. When we get to the winery, the process starts with reds being weighed and sugar tested just like whites. We te going on to red crush, we tend to think of crushers as optional for whites because we often will whole, pre whole cluster press whites. In other words, we bypass the crusher and put the red clusters directly in the press. We don't, usually don't do that for reds. Well, I would say we always don't do that for reds because we, we're not going to separate the red juice from the skins. We're going to do at least some of the fermentation with the juice in contact with the skins. So, crushers and destemmers are optional for whites, but always used with reds. Now, we can sometimes destem in our crusher destemmer, but maybe not necessarily crush. So we'll look at Ken. We'll, we'll look at the crusher destemmer up close, and you'll see the rollers at the bottom of the crusher destemmer. Those rollers can actually be pulled out of the way, so that 
we destem our clusters, but we don't do a separate crushing step to crush the grapes. Many people believe there's plenty of crushing accomplished just by the destemming process, so you don't need to crush the grapes separately. And crushing sometimes will extract some harsher flavors from the skins, and so people like to be gentle and oftentimes don't crush at all with reds. So we'll talk to Pat Henderson next week at Kenwood, see what his approach is. Crushing does make grapes easier to move. Um, they're easier to pump, and here's a crusher and a must pump. So the crusher is, is here, of course. The must pump here is actually pulled out. This would be that you'd slide this underneath the crusher destemmer to catch the grapes that fall down through the crusher destemmer. Uh, but then that's a typical must pump. You'd catch the grapes in here and pump them off to a tank. So it's easier to pump after you've crushed. You can gravity feed from crusher to tank. And so here's an example of a crusher here that's sitting over a tank that would be underground effectively or on the lower story in this building. So here might be openings to tanks. We can uncover them, put the crusher right over the tank, and crush directly into the tank. So we get gentle extraction. We don't have to pump the must from the crusher off to the tank. So we'll look at that um, at Kenwood as well and see how they do it. Occasionally you can add stems. Winemakers will add stems back to the red crush. And stems will impart some more phenolics and oftentimes some flavors to the red wine. Northern Rhone Syrahs, for example, have historically been uh, fermented in contact with some of the stems. So up here in the Northern Rhone, here on this map on the right, if you look at Cote Roti, um, they traditionally will ferment in contact with some stems and it gives some of that smoky character to Northern Rhone Syrahs. Modern techniques in the Northern Rhone often exclude stems, so they're made in more of a fruit forward style, a less smoky style. So that's a winemaker choice. As we go to more cool weather Syrahs, and Northern Rhone Cote Roti is a cool weather Syrah, as we do more cool weather Syrahs in our county, we might be experimenting more with adding stems back. All right, let's move on to carbonic maceration. This is an alternative to traditional fermentation. So this, this technique is used, this technique is used in things like Nouveau Beaujolais. Nouveau Beaujolais, if you haven't had it, is released in November, just two months after the grapes are harvested. So they get harvested, processed very quickly, bottled and released in time for Thanksgiving here in the United States. Um, they, are, they are fermented by carbonic maceration and that gives a very light and fruity character to the wine and there's no malolactic fermentation partly because we don't have time to do it in those couple of months um, but we retain the acidity by not doing a higher acidity by not doing malolactic fermentation and we get this nice light and fruity wine often tastes a little bit bubble gummy um, a little bit of banana character those fermentation esters that are produced by yeast during fermentation. Remember we talked about those five buckets of flavor, one of which was fermentation esters produced by yeast during fermentation. A lot of those are preserved in wines that get carbonic maceration. They're preserved and actually enhanced. Carbonic maceration uh, it takes place differently than yeast fermentation as I mentioned. You don't add yeast. All right, so you, you don't add yeast, at least initially. There's an intracellular fermentation that takes place. In other words, the grape does a fermentation inside the berry. So you do not crush the berries. You let this intracellular fermentation takes place. It's a different process than yeast would use to make alcohol. But the grape then converts about one-fifth of the sugar to alcohol and CO2. It also produces more glycerol. Um, you get less extraction because you don't have the skin juice contact that you have. You don't have the, the same extent of ju skin juice contact like you would have if you crushed the grapes. So grapes are uncrushed. You do this intracellular, in, intra, um, intra-grape fermentation, 
that produces this characteristic bubblegum strawberry jam kind of aroma. If you've never had it, I recommend getting a Nouveau Beaujolais. It's fun to try. The way this works is the, the, the grape will consume about a fifth of the sugar intracellularly inside the grape and inside the intracellular and inside the skins. Once that's done, you will actually press the, re the remaining juice out of the grape and then fermentation takes place like normal. So if you can, you can picture the grape is intact, you let it do the carbonic maceration, about one-fifth of the sugar is, is consumed. Then you break open the grape and then you finish consuming the remaining four-fifths of the sugar by a normal yeast fermentation. At that point you can add yeast or you can of course do an indigenous fermentation if you want. Uh, but that's how carbonic maceration works. Sometimes uh, people will do carbonic maceration on purpose for, for wines other than Nouveau Beaujolais, and they might do 10 to 25% of the clusters by carbonic maceration. It gives a little bit of flavor impact, not as much as the full Nouveau Beaujolais will get by doing carbonic maceration with all your grapes. But you can do it with Pinot Noir, you can do it with Gamay grapes if you'd like, do a partial carbonic maceration. Finishing up this section then, I just wanted to um, give you a heads up to this uh, video here. It's a nice look at night harvest at our local Radio Couteau winery. Um, it's a very artistic look at night harvest. This was I was going to show you this during class just to, to break up the lecture. Uh, I'll let you go, ahead, get, go out and watch it on your own, but not required. Just a nice, nice artistic um, look at night harvest. So that finishes part one. Uh, I will put this on YouTube and then we'll pick up with parts two and three. Thanks for watching.